the last hour of this third day of the Internet Governance Forum. But uh, the subject that we are currently going to touch and talk about and that our distinguished panelists are going to elaborate is a subject that's going to touch everybody's lives. The subject uh, is related to emerging cyber law trends of 2009. The Internet Governance Forum is happening in the last month of the year 2008. A lot of developments have taken place. We would try in this session to do some crystal gazing. This session is being organized by cyberlaws.net, which is an online consultancy, and we do work in all issues uh, pertaining to cyber law. I'm the president of cyberlaws.net, and I, Pavan Dugal, am also the uh, a practicing attorney in the Indian Supreme Court. I work in technology law related issues and cyber law and cyber crime related uh, subjects. This evening, uh, I am delighted to introduce to you a very distinguished panel. This panel consists of people who have diverse backgrounds, people who have distinctive visions, and uh, personalities who have contributed in their own remarkable way in their area of expertise. I would take this opportunity to present to you the panel that we have this evening. Well, on my immediate right is Mr. Adam Mumby, who is a senior legal officer of Tanzania Communications Regulatory Authority. Uh, Mr. Mumby is a part-time lecturer in cyber law and intellectual property law in the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Well, sitting next to uh, Mr. Adam Mumby, is Ms. Patrice Lyons, who's the Corporate Counsel for Cooperation for National Research Initiatives, Reston, Virginia, in the United States. Sitting next to Ms. Lyons is Mr. Jayanto Fernando. Uh, Jayanta Fernando is the Director and Legal Advisor to the ICT Agency of Sri Lanka. He's a Vice Chair Elect of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers Government Advisory Committee, or GAC. He has specialized in information technology and telecom law. He's responsible for law reform agenda in Sri Lanka for the last 12 years and has also established the Sri Lanka CERT. On my immediate left is an old friend, a dear colleague, and more importantly, a man who needs no introduction for those who have worked very closely in the area of privacy law. Uh, he is uh, Mr. Joseph Alahaf. He is the Vice President of Global Public Policy, as also the Chief Privacy Officer of uh, Oracle. Joe is a guy who, to whom governments listen, to whom corporates listen, and he's a man who has a distinctive vision. So uh, we will be having and listening to his vision as well. And on my, on the immediate right, we have with us Mr. Abilesh Nair, who is a lecturer at the Sheffield Holm University, and he's a sol solicitor in the United Kingdom. His expertise is internet law, content regulation of censorship, as well as children's rights. He has been advising leading IT journals, and, uh, which are widely published, and has been a regular speaker at various conferences of academic institutions. Having this distinguished panel, I requested the panel to come up with their visions of what they thought will be the emerging cyber law trends of uh, 2009. But before we call on to the, uh, the first speaker and the first panelist, I thought I'd like to share with you what we at cyberlaws.net believe could be important areas which will <laughs> definitely occupy center stage attention in the times that we, uh, that we are going to see in the next year. I move on to the dice. Well, when one talks about these emerging cyber law trends, uh, we often have seen that people would tend to see the crystal ball through different visions. But one thing is very clear. The year 2009 uh, will be a watershed in the history of emerging internet economy. Well, every year is a different year, but 2009 is different. Why? Because something dramatic has happened in 2008. 2009 will possibly see the pinch and feel the most of the pinch of the economic slowdown. Something that we have never seen, something that's never happened after the late 1920s, has now visited the world. 2009 will be the first year in which formidable impact of the economic recession will be felt throughout the world. And that suddenly changes the contours and the context of what subject we are talking about. When we talk about cyber law trends, I think 
uh, in the in the, in the year 2009 these emerging cyber law trends shall have a direct bearing and relevance for the year 2009 both for governments as also for corporates and entities the first thing that comes to one's mind is that there will be increased cyber crime it's been historically shown that in in times of recession crime increases because time is a very logical way of generation of money so it's but natural to expect increased growth of cyber crime in the light of the economic sh slowdown increased cyber crime as historically proved during recession times would once again demonstrate the inadequacy or inefficiency of existing cyber crime legislations in national jurisdictions focus this year could be on strengthening the regulation of cyber crime and having adequate provisions connected therewith this year will also see nations struggling to come up with their own detailed legal provisions pertaining to cyber crime a large number of countries still do not have adequate regulation on cyber crimes so more so in the context of developing world and during the economic slowdown and recession countries would automatically be required to minimize expenses hence the rationale of joining international treaty on cyber crime will certainly assume more significance and it's here that we can mention about the convention on cyber crime of the council of europe which assumes tremendous significance as the only internationally acceptable and in operation treaty that we currently have internet 2.0 will continue to develop but so will be accompanied by more internet 2.0 cyber crimes the more increase of these cyber crimes will require governments to come across with more detailed legal provisions for preventing the same information security will assume far more significance the terrorist strikes in different countries will ensure that national security and information security shall take precedence over individual rights at the same time 2009 is also likely to see far more reduction of the scope of law of privacy in the context of internet like what happened in the us after the 911 it's likely to see more uh, a reaction replay where different citizens of different countries would not mind giving away some portions of their privacy in exchange for far more secure internet cyberspace as also their computers computer systems as well as computer networks this is going to be one phenomenon that's going to demand, uh, dominate the world in 2009 cyber terrorism is come to going to come to full bloom as far as the next year is going to come and we will see far more legal regulations and provisions to regulate cyber crime and especially cyber terrorism internet 2.0 will suddenly start opening up more doors of potential legal exposure the exposure will be of the social networking sites to legal consequences and that could potentially mean that such networking sites would be more inclined to adequately protect themselves and their legal interests in the face of growing abuse and misuse of their platforms by and netizens and by the netizens data protection has been relevant continues to be relevant and this year will also find its place in center stage it will be an important aspect of national legislations which will be given appropriate significance you don't really necessarily identify cyber law with mobiles but hold on the emerging jurisprudence has it that the mobiles and the mobile platforms are part of the emerging cyber law jurisprudence the increased usage of mobiles and mobile platforms and networks would necessarily imply that the governments would need to make appropriate regulatory provisions within existing cyber law which are applicable to mobiles and mobile platforms with the mobile content being generated so much with so much of mmss and other kind of uh, value added services that we are seeing in the mobile sector we are likely to to see a, a, an attempt towards their regulation in the in the next coming year this is a hot topic well service providers say they will not be liable 
netizens are saying, hold on, you need to be liable. So this entire hot debate will still spill on to the year 2009. The issue will be hot. People would still argue on both sides of the fences, depending on what their allegiances are. However, there will be no denying the fact that the Internet 2.0 websites or service providers shall be the repositories <coughs> of all the third-party data or information made available by them. Hence, the need for their potential exposure to liability in the event of anything happening to such data cannot be ruled out. This has grabbed limelight in the last few years, but will continue to strengthen its pillars, electronic discovery, more so in the context of cyberspace and computerized logs maintains, maintained by the service providers will become increasingly far more important and gain acceptance much beyond the shores of the United States. It's started happening in countries like India where despite not having specific direct provisions on electronic discovery, uh, the courts are now beginning to read the requirements of electronic discovery as part of due diligence on behalf of network service providers for third-party data or information made available by them. UGC, it's not the University Grants Commission in India, it is the user-generated content. Content is king and user-generated content will be king. Now if this king is coming in, this crowned king will also need some regulation. So we will see that the emergence of user-generated content, especially the video content in the light of the YouTubes of the world, will, game, will throw up very complicated legal issues pertaining to their ownership, pertaining to their existence on the servers, and pertaining to their transmissions. Of course, there will be need for adopting of an innovative legislative approach in this regard. Copyright and intellectual property rights are like evergreen subjects. And I think the law pertaining to copyrights, the infringement of copyright will continue to evolve in the context of text, audio, and video files on the internet as are made available on the internet. Of course, the debate on intellectual property will still continue. Intellectual property versus open source. Well, nobody will be clear winner, but clearly the winner will be the ultimate issue of rights of people within the original artistic, literary, dramatic, or cinematic graphic works that are authored by the original authors. Spam has been making headlines this year, but will make much bigger headlines because it will continue to engage the attentions of the governments. The year 2009 should also potentially see far more focus on establishing the legal regimes to regulate spam. In conclusion, all I can say is these are some of the, the subjects that we at cyberlaws.net felt would be relevant for the year 2009. I'm sure our uh, panel of um, experts are going to talk and uh, deliberate on far more important issues. But one thing is very clear. 2009 will see new areas of cyber law that will seek to occupy the attention of various stakeholders. And countries need to act proactively on the said issues in order to leapfrog and meet the dragon of economic recession that's looming its face on the horizon. That's uh, the presentation from my side. And on that note, I would uh, take this opportunity to invite the only lady speaker that we have uh, with us on the panel, Ms. Beatrice Lyons, to come up and give her perspectives on this subject. Ms. Beatrice. Years, there have been various groups that have addressed the interplay between technology and the law I have been a member of the Cyberspace Law Committee of the American Bar Association, and we started many years ago on such issues as examining the legal impact, say, of digital signatures. Where do they fit into the grand scheme? Um, the legislation in our Congress on e-sign. There's also been a continuing debate about contracting and the validity of contracts, just what do you have to do to make them legally enforceable? Now, as we move forward, there are many new areas that are going to require analysis by the legal community. And here I'd like to put in my own special plea that we drop and erase the E before, say, e-government and e-education and e-health. Because basically what I'd like to see us reflect on is the existing body of law 
and not necessarily feel that in all cases we have to move it aside and come up with something else just because the internet is involved in the mix or new technical capabilities are involved. Now, as I mentioned, the digital signatures and e-sign, they required specific attention from the aspect of the networking. In this context, too, I have found over the years that it's very important for the technical community to team with the legal community, even sometimes on a one-on-one -on -one situation where you're addressing a specific issue, that you can sort of go back and forth. Well, here's how we could address in the law, and the technical community can say, well, we could make this better, you know, or this is not the way it works in the real world, and, and you could go back and forth, because I think that would result in laws that would be more effective and perhaps longer term have a life. And, uh, and I think that's one of the um, lifebloods of the law is to have predictability in relations that you're not doing something today. And then when the next buzzword du jour comes up the following week that you're going to have to change it. This doesn't work. It's not really a good thing to have in the law. You have to have predictability. <laughs> Uh, I've been privileged over the years to work with uh, the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, the principal Robert Kahn and his former vice president, Vin Cerf. Um, we've worked together over the years on various issues involving the internet. And particularly in recent years, I have been counsel on several research projects involving new capabilities that, for short, CNRI has been evolving to move the internet to the next logical stage. One of them in particular that you may have been familiar with that Bob uh, addressed at some of the um, workshops at this session of the IGF had to do with this new digital object architecture where it's possible to focus on a sequence of bits, a data structure, and identify that data structure in commerce. So I took a crack at that and Bob and I sat down about seven years ago and I took out a subject that I thought would be something that might be relevant globally, and that has to do with bills of lading in the uh, global commerce and its associated documentation because, of course, you're going to have letters of credit, insurance documents. And also, in, in exploring this, um, I viewed the modern approach that, and not being a transportation attorney, basically my, my formation is as a copyright lawyer, um, I became familiar with the present concept where they don't want to go port to port, they want to go door to door. So you have planes and trains and ships, it's a very complicated but exceedingly interesting, and interesting environment. So in this context, I was looking at the basic legal instruments that we're all familiar with in the law. Instruments like deeds and as I mentioned, bills of lading, letters of credit. Now most of them today are on paper. They're on paper. So if you get rid of the paper, and you have the paper here, you get rid of it, you have a value. And there's nothing to say that in an internet environment you can continue to be constricted by the paper. Because a lot of times, even when you talk about a web page, they, they simply are replicating pre-existing data structures <clears throat> when it's possible to do very interesting and innovative things. Now, in the bill of lading situation, uh, I was looking at taking the digital object architecture, and in particular the handle system, which is the unique persistent identifier. And say, for example, you have a container that has an RFID tag on it. Well, that's just another set of bits. So if you persistently identify those bits and associate those bits with other information having to do with the cargo that's being shipped, then you're, you're, you're breaking out of the box. You're, you're addressing a bill of lading in a very dynamic way. You could associate that information with insurance documents, various other documents in commerce. So we wrote an article uh, back, oh, I think seven years ago, and it's been published in a legal journal, and if anyone's interested, I, and you give me your email, I'll send you uh, a link to it. I, from the technical perspective, Bob said, well, let's look at authenticating those bits. 
So he was looking at doing a hash of the bits and having a hash as the suffix and the identifier so that if he received it, it was self-authenticating. So that opened the door to perhaps having the, a bearer bond where you could have an original data structure go from A to B to C. You didn't have to reference back to say an e-vault to, to figure out what it is you're dealing with. And this permits the mobility of say a bill of lading in commerce. If you can have an authenticatable bit string that when you interpret it, it's a bill of lading. Now, why am I bringing this up in the context of a discussion of 2009? Well, the, for many years, the uh, shipping industry has been developing uh, a new convention for carriage of goods wholly or partially by sea. The principal body that's been working on this is the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, or UNCTRAL headquartered in Vienna. They are coming to the end of this whole cycle and successfully. They've developed a convention and I'm understanding that next September they may have the rolling out in Rotterdam and I think they're going to call it the Rotterdam Rules. Um, and as part of this convention there are provisions that authorize the use of electronic transaction documents. So there's a general blanket authorization to move ahead with some of these newer reconceptualization of what it means to be documents in the shipping industry. So once that gets through and all these folks that have been working on it for so many years step back, the next logical stage is okay now we have the green light, let's see how we can work it out. So I took myself to a, a meeting a couple of years ago on modern law for global commerce and UNCTRAL in Vienna was a nice place to go anyhow. <laughs> Vienna's quite a lovely city. And uh, I stood up and a lot of the folks that were there were from the shipping industry. And I proposed, I said, well, once the convention moves through, and, and I, it's clear now that's happened, um, let's turn to perhaps doing a pilot project. And I offered the digital object architecture and the handle system in particular to help organize this on a global basis. Well, I've had some ongoing discussions with folks and it looks like perhaps something may move ahead, but these things take time. You start, you plant an idea and then maybe, maybe somebody tries out a little project and, and then that grows and you never know where things go. But I, I really think that in the coming years, not just in 2009, we will have a wonderful opportunity to, as lawyers, not just to change laws, just to change laws, but to see if we can change some of the things in a more practical way that enable commerce. And maybe at the end of the day, the laws are just fine, but the way you implement it requires a regulatory change here and there. For example, in my ex example about the shipping industry, the handle system allows metadata registries. Well, that's something that you could populate with specific information to the shipping industry or the insurance or banking industry, the related industries. Or there is also something known as the type registry. So that in the world of the internet, if you're doing this kind of commerce, that you would have an easy way to resolve to specific information uh, using the type registry. So I offer that as a uh, possible approach, and if anyone is interested, I would certainly like to talk to you, and um, I welcome this opportunity to share my ideas. Thank you. Thank you for neglecting cyber law issues for 2009. Chairman of this panel, uh, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have just um, a few things to, to say uh, with regard to the emerging um, cyber law issues. What are the cyber law issues that are emerging by 2009? I will start um, by referring what has been said by the President of, of Law, um, Honorable Pavan. He said that uh, you have growth and increase of cyber crimes. That means new offenses are coming up, which are not there in our laws. So as we go further, we're going to have new and new offenses. And again, he also mentioned that the new ways of commit, I mean, uh, you, you are coming up with new ways of committing offenses. 
you are having the new offenses, but again, there is a new way of committing offenses because of the development of technology. He mentioned about terrorism, but now you are going to have cyber terrorism. They are using new means of, of committing offenses. And then there is a the question of in, inadequate legal provisions as we go further, and more importantly, um, intellectual property rights infringement. As you said, copyright. There is a the question of infringement of intellectual property rights because of the development of technology. Then from there, um, I go straight forward to the question of theft of information. As you said, we are going to, to see more and more copyrighted materials are going to be infringed. But we have the laws already, and we are going to have the laws, but there are certain questions which are unanswered in our laws, for instance, from my country, and I think most countries which follow common law. They have the problem on defining some of the um, uh, legal issues. For instance, um, if you look at the question of theft, because now we are saying that is this an information society, but the information can, is information can be, can, can someone steal information? Can you steal data? You are complaining that you have lost your information. You are complaining that you have lost your data. How are you going to, to, to arrest that, that person who has, has stolen your information? Because if you go to our laws, what does the, the law always, will always say? There must be intention. There must be the question of some, somebody being permanently deprived of his property. But now, due to the development of digital technology, information can be stolen without being, some, uh, being permanently de uh, deprived. Does that amount to theft? So that's a very, very important question that's going to be um, addressed by the laws. That's one. Again, the other issue I, I thought, um, from my understanding, uh, there is also the question of, of when, we, when, we, when we deal with e-commerce, um, you are dealing with electronic transaction, there is, there is a question of how do we define goods? Because we have the laws which deals with goods, which deals with sale of goods. If you go to our laws, we find the goods are defined is something which is uh, tangible. Yeah? But now you have software, you have digital goods, you have digital services, you have e-books, you have uh, e-videos. Are those goods according to our laws? So you have to think about that. How are we going to define these uh, goods so that to cover e-goods or e-services? I, I read that case, um, there is that case you can read on, on your own, that is City, Alabama City, and th I think this is the uh, 1996, they were trying to define what are the goods. Um, the third thing I've also mentioned yesterday is the way offenses are being committed now. People are using computers to commit offense. People are using computers to steal our property, for instance, to steal money. But again, there is a question of deception in our laws. But if someone uses a computer system or any other related devices and he steals our, proper, he steal our property, but does that amount to, to an offense? Because according to, to the law, you cannot deceive computer system. It's only the person who is going to be deceived. And there is also the reference on that case. Um, uh, Lord Morris said that for a person, for a deception to take place, there must be a, some person or person who will have been deceived. That's the decision. So we have to think about that. Because now someone can access your, your, your account system and steal your money. He stays with, uh, he puts your money in his account for maybe two or three hours, and then after a short time he returns to your, to your account again. Does that amount to, to theft? Because you still have money and he gained uh, interest from that. Um, lastly, there is a the question of electronic evidence. In most of, of our laws, electronic evidence is not admissible, it's not allowed. You cannot go before the court with computer printout, they will say this is it's not original. Because the law say you must have an original evidence in a written form signed. But of course, some of the countries, they have amended their laws to allow electronic evidence. But still the question is, how about computer integrity? That's a critical issue. You cannot just say this is admissible evidence, but how about computer integrity? So those are the, the issues that we, we need to consider. Um, maybe I finish my, my presentation by, those, uh, by, by some of the questions that I have raised that we need to think as we go further um, to the next uh, generation. We all know that internet 
our cyberspace does not recognize sovereignty or there is no territorial limitation. There is no dispute about that. But you have to ask ourselves where things really happen. If there is any offense, how can we determine wh how, where these things happen? Which country has the right to, to arrest those people who are committing cyber crimes? Is it India? Is it US or Tanzania and Africa? Because anything can happen anywhere. And which court will have jurisdiction to deal with these cases? Of course, you can also ask yourself which legal system will apply. So that's uh, the problem with jurisdiction. And I've referred to you that case, or you can read on your own time, Yahoo case, what happened in that, in that case about jurisdiction problem. So that is the end of my presentation. To me, I think those are the issues that are going to merge. And we, th we need to think when we, we make laws and when we want to come up with international conventions to deal with this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mambi, for your pers perspectives on what is taking place. So over to you, Fernando. Panel today. Uh, we all know that this transition from the paper-based environment to an environment which is paperless and a network environment has created great opportunities as well as challenges for both governments, businesses, and for end users. These opportunities also go with challenges, and various governments have taken various approaches to addressing these challenges. And uh, I think Pawan set the stage in how uh, the, the, the broad peripheral issues that are addressed commonly by most jurisdictions. So what I would like to do is to focus on uh, four areas where progress has been made in my jurisdiction in terms of legislative reform, and also enlighten you through those four areas what we in our society see as challenges and what we think will be emerging cyber law issues from a developing country perspective. So the four areas that I will touch will be on touch upon will be on intellectual property rights, electronic transactions, data protection or privacy, and cybercrime. So I'm mindful of the time limitations and confine it to six to seven minutes. In terms of intellectual property rights, we have in, in our country the Intellectual Property Act number 36 of 2003, primarily addressing the obligations, the World Trade Organization obligations arising from the TRIPS agreement that Sri Lanka committed to in 1994. As many countries did, we also took time and we got extensions of time to implement legislative frameworks to be TRIPS compliant, and we did so only in October 2003 by the enactment of the Intellectual Property Act number 36 of 2003. This act covers all the important issues, uh, particularly in the area of protecting computer software, etc., and also provides a separate chapter for the protection of uh, integrated circuits. But what we see lacking is the extent to which it addresses digital content. So we have a challenge as to whether countries like Sri Lanka or developing countries in this region should sign up to the WIPO internet treaties or whether we should not sign up to it. That decision is still to be made. And if we do decide to sign, we see that as an emerging issue that we have to address in our country. Now, Pawan very clearly articulated the economic challenges that we will see in the coming year. This economic dark cloud might also have a silver lining in our countries because it will compel governments and businesses to look at other options, cheap options, when it comes to deployment of information systems and products within organizations or within governments. So that will compel our societies to look at adoption of license uh, open source tools, open source based products, etc. Now that, lead, that will lead to a situation where 
our legal and technology and business and governmental community will have to be aware of the broad peripheral, peripheral issues or broad issues emanating from licensing associated with free and open source products. Many people think that force means is free. The, the freedoms that are associated with it to modify, use, distribute, etc., are not clearly understood in our societies. And I see that as an interesting emerging legal issue, cyber law issue for a developing country in, in our context. The second area is electronic transactions. Sri Lanka enacted the uh, very business friendly, technology neutral electronic transactions act number 19 of 2006 on the 8th of March 2006 and brought it into operation on the 1st of October 2007. While we were drafting that legislation, we were also mindful of the deliberations taking place at, in Ancitra. Now, although our legislation was compliant with both the ANSITRA model law on electronic commerce and the model law on electronic signatures, we were mindful of the deliberations going on in the area of electronic contracting. The Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in, in, uh, in Electronic Contracts was adopted in November 2005, and some of the salient features of that were embedded into our national legislation. Sri Lanka also became the first country in South Asia to sign up to the convention in July 2006. But we, what we see lacking is in the area of proper understanding amongst the legal community to implement the, the legislation, which is a common theme and an issue that has been discussed at other panels. In terms of admissibility of electronic records documents, this electronic transactions legislation introduced a novel evidentiary regime that made use of uh, a set of broad principles that opened the admissibility gateway for the first time in the country and shifted away from the traditional rules of evidence. And for the first time, we saw one month ago a bold decision given by our judiciary where SMS electronic SMS transmissions being admitted in the course of a proceeding in a money recovery case in the commercial high court. Now, what I see as an emerging issue in that context is where to, to, to what extent our legal community is prepared to address all this aspect of evidence, how familiar are they with electronic admissibility issues, and how we address that we become an emerging issue for countries like Sri Lanka. Thirdly, data protection or privacy. We all know the benefits and the downsides. I don't want to uh, go on to that area because we have eminent experts from Oracle who will address that specifically. But I will just enlighten you of the challenges that, that I see as an emerging issue for us. Countries like Sri Lanka are compelled to look at adopting measures to safeguard data and ensure privacy within our country. That is because we have had to deal with businesses and organizations, specifically from the European community. And the issue is when they tr transfer that information for processing in countries like Sri Lanka in an outsourcing or BPO environment, the extent to which we should safeguard and protect that information to be compliant with the standards required of the European Community Directive on data protection. So that has led us into a debate within Sri Lanka, especially this year, as to whether we sh should introduce legislation on data protection versus whether we should have a code of practice. And of course, with months of debate, both within the legal and the parliamentary community, we have concluded that a better option will be to have a set of safe harbor kind of principles, a code of practice that companies can voluntarily adopt that we proposed, we, we proposed preparing. And that is another interesting emerging issue that we see as a possible 
uh, aspect coming up in the forthcoming year. Now, again, economic gloom will also may compel companies and organizations in the developed societies to do more outsourcing. So that's why mm -hmm. perhaps developing countries may have to rush and perhaps legislate or have conducive frameworks, voluntary frame frameworks for protection of data to be compatible with the European guidelines. If you have to transact with European businesses that want to process data and information in countries like Sri Lanka in an outsourcing environment. Finally, the fourth point I want to emphasize finally is cybercrime and electronic crime. Here again, last year we saw bold initiatives being taken by countries like Sri Lanka in enacting very positive legislation, the Computer Crimes Act number 24 of 2007, that addresses all issues pertaining to cybercrime. Issues where the, 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 the crime committed using computers as a tool to commit other crimes, and cr crimes committed using computers like hacking, theft, you know, uh, integrity offenses, confidentiality, integrity, availability of data issues. All of that have been addressed adequately within the framework of our law. But an area that we see emerging in the next year is, again, the ability of our enforcement organizations to enforce this legislation. So although, for example, in Sri Lankan legislation, we have novel procedures established so that experts could assist the investigative process and the, if those experts have been given protection under the law, and the experts have been given, have been, ob, have been obligated under the law to ensure confidentiality and to ensure that the business, day to day business operations of the organization is not hampered with when they carry out investigations. How best will it work? So these are some of the challenges we will face, and I see that as an emerging issue in the coming year. Finally, in the context of electronic crime, a parting comment I want to make is that in legislating in that subject, we realized quite early that we can't be in isolation. Cybercrime is multi-jurisdictional multi in nature, and if we are to collaborate with the international community in this subject, we can't have a situation where the doors are shut. Collaboration and mutual cooperation and assistance requires countries to harmonize legislation and to be compatible with other norms and practices adopted internationally. And in that light, we saw an opportunity in the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, and our legislation on cybercrime was built around it. And I am happy to say that the Council of Europe is looking at our legislation as, a compat as, as being compatible with the Council of Europe Convention, and we look at that as a, perhaps a measure that can be adopted by other developing countries so that the doors that are generally shut when it comes to mutual cooperation and assistance will be open. So that I see as another interesting emerging cyber law issue in the coming year. So with those thoughts, I will end my short presentation. Thank you very much for the hearing. What are the perspectives from uh, the eyes of uh, the British jurisprudence? I now call upon Abhilash, Abhilash Nair to talk about his perspectives on the emerging cyber law issues for 2009. Um, which is slightly strange considering the title of the session as uh, emerging issues. And the reason I stick to an old issue is because it hasn't been resolved yet. Um, we've had a couple of sessions on child protection, child safety, which all centered around the issue of protecting children as objects. I'll explain. I classify exploitation of children into two different broad areas. One is where children, as, children are exploited as objects, one example would be when they are made to participate in pornography, then the exploitation is direct, a child, a real child is actually harmed. 
and there is some sort of universal consensus with respect to the issue of uh, children exploited as actual participants or directly harmed through uh, the production of pornography. There has been very little talk about the issue of children exploited as targets, or in other words, where children are exposed to content that are inappropriate to them due to the very fact that they are children. And that is specific to the internet, because if you see the real world or the offline world, you'll always find plenty of legislation and regulatory uh, regime that protect children. One example would be a child cannot go into a sex shop uh, in the UK and buy an R-rated or X-rated video or a magazine. It is because it's illegal to sell content that is inappropriate, that are pornographic, to a child. Um, but unfortunately, the same child can buy the same stuff online because uh, the law does not protect the child well enough as much as it happens in the real world. The one fine example to demonstrate the difference uh, can be uh, from a US perspective. Um, when way back in 1996, uh, the US government tried to legislate and enacted the Communications Decency Act, which made it an offense to target minors, children, with inappropriate or pornographic content. Uh, which was challenged in a court uh, within 24 hours of its enactment, and the Supreme Court eventually struck it down as unconstitutional because there was an unacceptable uh, clash with the right to free speech of adults. Uh, there was a clash with the protected First Amendment. Uh, a subsequent effort in 1998 uh, followed. It was called the Child Online Protection Act, COPA, which also uh, uh, was defeated uh, in the courts. It actually suffered a very protracted litigation, and the latest that I know of was a circuit uh, court ruling in July 2008, which held the uh, legislation unconstitutional. And a number of issues were identified, and one of the major issues was that the internet is inherently different from other types of media. There were many analogies drawn to uh, television, print, radio, uh, but the main reason why the internet was distinguished between uh, with, with other forms of existing traditional media was it takes a few steps from the part of the end user to access content online. Uh, you might have a fancy satellite television, cable TV that offers up to 800 channels perhaps, but you do, you're quite a captive audience when it comes to television. Once you turn on the TV, you actually watch what is being shown on the screen. Unlike the internet, where you actually have to type in uh, the web address of the, web, the website you want to visit. Um, so, which is the reason why television is heavily uh, regulated, and from a civil rights point of view, it was argued that because it takes a lot of steps from the end user to access the web page, you cannot come across uh, a website accidentally, uh, so the internet does not call for the same degree or level of, of regulation. This has been um, challenged by research studies in the London School of Economics, um, which highlighted that a significant percentage of children come across uh, pornography and other inappropriate content while surfing for other websites. There is also a study, well, this is in the background, that um, about 4.2 million websites on the internet are pornographic that constitute about 420 million pages, and 90% of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed porn online. And most of them did uh, watch the pornography while doing their homework. Now, what is the issue? The real issue is, because the internet is unique, in the sense that it has a global reach, any regulation will have to confirm to the strictest community standard. Example would be, if you take the example of the United States, there are 50 states, each of these states has a different community standard. There might be content which is perfectly legal to watch and access in New York, but which might offend in Tennessee. So if a publisher chooses to publish something uh, from New York and publishes it online, then 
if COPA had come into force, that would mean that they will have to conform to the standard of Tennessee to avoid prosecution, for the simple reason that the Internet does not recognize geographical boundaries. And this was regarded as an unacceptable interference with the right to free speech. Now, that is the US position. And if you bring that in the international arena, there are many countries with very different community standards. And unless you can identify a common standard, you cannot uh, effectively regulate uh, this area of law where children ought to be uh, protected from exposure to uh, pornography and other content that are inappropriate to them. Um, what's the solution? I'm not proposing any solutions, and not even had to give any answers to that. But my um, suggestion would be that if you can tie this into any of the existing human rights, international human rights regime, for example, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which again has a provision on pre preventing all types and all forms of child sexual exploitation, exploitations against children, but it is silent on the aspect of, again, children as, as targets, but whereas it specifically mentions uh, child pornography. But the reference here is to children actually participating as actors uh, in, in pornography. There is no direct mention of um, ch children as targets or children being targeted with uh, inappropriate content. It's the same with Cybercrime Convention as well. Not just child pornography, um, sorry, uh, the issue of children t being targeted with porn, even with respect to um, the, the issue of racial hatred, while the Cybercrime Convention was drafted, the clause referring to uh, racial hatred was relegated as an optional protocol because the, the member states could not reach an agreement regarding a, a common uh, ground. Um, so, an ideal first step for law, for international law, would be to recognize that this is an issue. And when I say that law has to recognize that it's an issue, law does recognize that this is an issue, at least with respect to the offline world. Just because the, the, the channel of delivery, or the medium of delivery of content is different, is the internet, does not call for a different treatment. And for that reason, it's important that um, International law recognizes this as a, a valid uh, issue which calls for immediate response. Um, a starting point would be um, to um, address this issue specifically within an international human rights instrument, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child would be a good starting point, considering it has uh, a lot of member states, all but two countries of the world have signed the convention. And the only two countries who haven't signed it are Somalia and the United States. Um, so that is the first issue I want to talk about. Am I OK for time coming? Two minutes. OK. Uh, quickly, moving on to a second issue I wanted to briefly address was, again, with respect to children and the amount of personal information they post on social networking sites like uh, Facebook and MySpace. In the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office had released a report in November 2007 which highlighted that a number of young people and children post a lot of um, personal information online in social networking sites without realizing the implications of the information they provide. And among a, a number of youngsters were interviewed, and when they were told that, there's a good chance that your potential or prospective employers might vet their employment application on the basis of their Facebook profile, about 45% of them actually said no, we don't want anybody who would be a potential employer to see what's held, uh, what, what's written on our uh, personal profile pages of the social networking sites. Um, Facebook also faced, um, is currently facing investigation by the Information Commissioner's Office for a uh, violation of the Data Protection Act. Um, specifically data retention. One of the principles of the Data Protection Act in the UK is that personal data cannot be held for longer than required. Um, apparently somebody tried to withdraw his profile from Facebook. Uh, what, what Facebook did was it, it um, withdrew it, but not on a permanent basis. 
uh, you get a nice message if you try to, I don't know if how many of you have actually a Facebook profile, I have one, if you try to withdraw that, um, the response you get, it has been withdrawn uh, for the time being, but if you ever have a change of mind, if you want to come back, all you need to do is to sign on using your uh, username and password and your uh, data can be retrieved. So they do not really delete it from the system, it's held as a backup copy within the server. It's, it's away from the public domain, the public cannot see it anymore, but nonetheless the data is still retained, which um, apparently is in breach of the Data Protection Act. Um, but again, how, how effective Data Protection Act uh, with respect to Facebook is questionable. Uh, because they subject you to the terms of use, which says that you're subject to US jurisdiction. Um, that's all I have time for, unfortunately. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to taking any questions you might have. Uh, this uh, particular workshop, but I now take this opportunity to invite the final panelist that we have on our panel, uh, which is Mr. Joseph Alahav, to come and give his perspectives on the subject at hand. Joe, the floor is all yours.